June 5th, 2021, that would be yesterday, will go down as a most historic day in this diocese, this local church. Bishop Rhodes yesterday, and I've been telling you this, so not too much of a surprise, ordained to the sacred priesthood seven young men. To put this in context, we're a pretty local, di- we're a pretty small diocese in these United States, 80 some parishes, relatively small. Our last ordination class of that size was in 1962. About 60 years since we've seen numbers like this. When I was born, we had a different bishop, Bishop John Michael Darcy, um, who I came to know a little bit closer um, during the year that I had off in seminary. He was the one to accept me to the seminary. He was the one even to kind of seek me out. I was his driver uh, during that year I was away. I remember very clearly during my time in seminary especially that he was always kind of looking ahead to the horizon, a, a kind of prophetic dynamic, if you will, predicting, longing for, and hoping for what he truly saw coming in this diocese, a kind of, a kind of new springtime, a flourishing of the efforts that he and so many others who collaborated with him were working toward. He anticipated and knew the day would come where we would have a very large ordination class and by God's grace, more than 30 seminarians and a kind of ongoing fruitfulness that we see. Bishop Rhodes yesterday at the very beginning of his homily, he quoted um, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger who gave a homily when he was Archbishop of Munich and Freising. By the way, he tied in the saint of the day. St. Boniface was yesterday, to whom we owe a great deal in this parish. St. Boniface was a great missionary to Germany, what we now call Germany. The German church probably would not have sprung up and been what it was without him. The original four dioceses, one of which was Freising, um, he, he led as archbishop, and of course, Ratzinger succeeded him many years down the line. But Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was archbishop of Munich and Freising, He said that, and Bishop Rhodes quoted this yesterday, for a local church, ordination day is harvest day. It's the day of harvest. That kind of took me back a little bit to recognize what goes into reaping a harvest. You have to look to the many years, even decades, of what precedes that. The seven young men ordained to the priesthood yesterday don't simply represent immediate actions of the Holy Spirit that took root in a moment and then all of a sudden out of nowhere we had seven priests. But hundreds if not thousands of people in this diocese who worked and prayed and longed and hoped for what would be. Inasmuch as Ordination Day is a kind of harvest day then, I couldn't help but think ultimately what we're looking at is a glimpse into the health and vitality of the Christian life in a particular church, a particular local church, this diocese, Fort Wayne South Bend. For each and every single one of us here, we are called to follow the Lord wherever he leads. Our baptism has united us to the Lord's death and resurrection, and we see that the fulfillment of our Christian life here on earth is really just that uniting ourselves with the Lord's sacrifice and making that our own, laying down our lives. That's the vocation of any Christian in any state in life, to do God's will first, to persevere through hardship, 
to continually and unrelentlessly lay down one's life in sacrifice. So for the local church here, this was a tremendously beautiful day and a grace-filled day and one which is leading us then and, and really pushing us into the future. What this looks like in practice would be individual parishes in this diocese have for many years done the work, if you will, of forming intentional disciples of Jesus to see clearly I'm not here for myself. You're not here for yourself. And we are to live entirely for the Lord. And as that begins to be embraced and fostered and embedded deeply within a parish culture, we see that vocations to the priesthood then just kind of flow naturally. As Harvest Day, as a kind of fulfillment of this sacrificial nature that the Christian life is, we know that no man just becomes a priest sort of by accident. That deep embeddedness of what it is to live for Jesus and to sacrifice one's life, that's an absolutely essential component to even finding out if that's what God wants, let alone persevering through the very difficult process of beginning the application process, discerning through seminary, and then ultimately being ordained and then being thrust into the ministry of Jesus Christ. What, to me, really unites all of this and grounds it and gives it a real expression and what does for, what did for Bishop Darcy, what does for Bishop Rhodes, what does continually still for now Pope Emeritus Benedict, I think would be what we celebrate today. The Feast of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Jesus. If our Christian life is to be united with him, if it is to follow after him in sacrificing our own selves and our lives, the Eucharist, as that sacrament which makes the Lord's sacrifice present to us, is that fundamental, practical, lived reality in the Christian life of breathing that air and eating that food and swimming in those waters. <clears throat> None of the guys in seminary that I went to seminary with would have, um, would have had just sort of a haphazard relationship with Jesus in the Eucharist. Every single young man in the seminary deeply longs to be a close friend of the Lord Jesus and longs to spend time with him in the tabernacle or exposed in Eucharistic adoration. So this great, this great uh, weekend for our diocese, for our local church, it gave me a little pause as well as pastor here. So bear with me for just a moment of acknowledging something that may not be the greatest or most awesome thing to acknowledge on what otherwise is such a beautiful weekend, but I promise you that this is going to a place of deep and abiding hope. So the brief pause for us here. I asked around. There are exactly zero priests of the Diocese of Fort Wayne South Bend alive from this parish. The last one was Father Joseph Jacobs. Many of those who have been here for a long time or just simply folks that have been in the South Bend area for a while would remember him. He grew up here. He was ordained in the 50s, I think, and he went to God in 2003. We do have one priest, one son of this parish, serving in the Society of Jesus. I met Father Mark George, SJ. He came for his dad's funeral last year in February. Again, the Eucharist as this formative place whereby the Christian comes to recognize his dignity and his identity in being united with Jesus to offer his life. May I just share them that Paul George, may he rest in peace, was in those pews every day. Now his son Mark, it was really funny. He gave probably the least complimentary homily I've ever heard in terms of like eulogizing his dad a little bit. Um, but if you ask me and I knew Paul, he knew that it was precisely his own 
weaknesses and faults that necessitated that he remain so close to Jesus in the Eucharist. So for us here then, here's the hope that I see, and here's what I see for us at St. Joseph's in Mishawaka as a, a sign of intense, intense hope at a new springtime for us too. If the Eucharist is that place that unifies all of these things, that integrates our Christian life and orients us toward offering our lives totally to the Lord, well, first and foremost, there are more people who come to Mass here on Sundays than most other parishes in the area post-pandemic. Thanks be to God. Now, the coronavirus is still out there. There is still some risk. Thanks, thanks be to God, much less risk. But the reality is that our lives are constantly engaged in forms of risk assessment. And by God's grace and his invitation, especially here, we see the flowering of folks saying, with their feet, worship of God is primary. I need to worship God. I need to be present here. I need to offer myself in union with the bread and the wine on the altar. I need to offer my life to the Lord, and I need to do that at Mass. And the Lord invites us to receive Holy Communion, that gift of himself. I see daily Mass very strong numbers here at our daily masses in growing usually. It seems like just a few more people here and there. And I want to speak just a little bit more about something that's very dear to my heart, which would be Eucharistic adoration. Time spent before the Blessed Sacrament exposed, which we'll have at the very end of this mass and we'll walk in procession and come back and have Eucharistic benediction. This time is so privileged as we get to see, even if still behind a veil, the Lord himself. These are those treasured moments of prayer where the Lord is active in our hearts. Maybe we just make ourselves present to him and we just come and we sit and we look at him and he looks at us. Friends, this, that experience of Eucharistic adoration in my life was what began to break down walls and barriers and helped me to know who I am and to give me the strength that I needed to follow where the Lord led me. So we began having Eucharistic adoration after the 7 o'clock Mass a few years ago. I'll be honest, it was selfish at first, especially. I wanted to make sure that I had a good chunk of time to pray every day, and I don't trust myself sometimes, so I knew that if that was simply happening, and I could hear confessions after Mass, and by the way, confessions, I've heard so many more confessions over the course of five years here, that I would have a chance then to pray and be with the Lord. And what started off is kind of a weird, like, jolt in daily Mass culture here where folks were like, oh, what's going on? It would take off right away after Mass. As time went on, more and more and more people, to the tune of now almost everybody, will kneel down in adoration after Mass and pray for even just a few minutes before taking off to work or taking off to school. Those that are able... We find that so many stay for at least 30 minutes. And I'm, con I'm continually floored to see that so many even stay the full hour. And I'm not alone in church, but there's 10, 15, 20 people here even after the full hour. An Irish Benedictine monk, um, who's anonymous, he kept a journal. It was published as a book, a book that's been growing in popularity among priests, especially it's called In Sinu Jesu. I heartily recommend it for anybody um, an invitation to deep Eucharistic communion with the Lord, especially aimed at priests, but no less profitable and fruitful for any Christian. That monk said this about a parish that takes upon itself the responsibility and the mission to have Eucharistic adoration. He said, yes, it benefits those there. It benefits those that are physically present in the church at that time of Eucharistic adoration, but those graces overflow and cascade into the greater parish family as well. So if you, even if you weren't aware, each and every single one of you has been touched by those times of prayer here in this church already. And if there's any inkling at all that you have to spend time with our Lord as well, 
it's there. Tuesdays as well in the evening, so 5.30 to 6.30. We also have seen many people coming to church. One of my big priorities when I got here was to unlock the church during the day so that the Lord present here would be available and we would be able to come and see him. And we've seen a lot more foot traffic throughout the day of those wanting to see the Lord. All of this, the Eucharist as that fundamental integrating dynamic that affords the Christian the ability to see in himself who he is and be able to offer his life to the Lord as a sacrifice. This is what's happening here. Parents and grandparents then modeling that and then inviting their children and the next generation to participate in that as well. And the other fruitfulness that I have seen here too is that just this year, we have one young man who is in the very beginning stages of applying to the seminary who would, if accepted, enter in a year. Um, He has to finish his last year of college first. In addition, in addition, we have another young man who has been in communication with the vocation director and the beginning of that discernment has borne the fruit of simply having him go to college for at least two years and then pursuing an application then, perhaps after the four, if college ends up being a particularly fruitful experience and that route is taken as well. Friends, we're not far off. (laughs) This fruit is born over time and this fruit is born by our fidelity as we celebrate the most sacred body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ today, who is truly present with us and who makes himself present to us, as Jesus himself invites every single one of us into deep and intimate friendship with him. As I'm pointing out to you the signs of fruitfulness that I see here in the parish, Sunday Mass attendance, daily Mass numbers, Eucharistic adoration, folks going to confession more frequently, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, outside of those times, whenever might be convenient and the church might be empty and quiet, as I see those signs of fruitfulness already taking root and blossoming, I have one question for every single one of us here. Will you come as well?